Hey, Steve. How you doing, man? Yeah, good, Sam. Good to be with you again. Yeah, really, really good to be with you too. Um, I have to say, um, I was looking at one of your previous videos today about the um, economics lesson in three minutes, um, or the most important economics lesson in three minutes. And I was thinking about that and how you a year ago were talking about how you see the market playing out in a year's time. And, and yeah, you, fortunately, you you were pretty, pretty spot on. Um, I just have my first question that I'll just dive straight into. Um, we see inflation playing out right now in the United States. Um, do you think we will see more inflation or do you think def deflation will likely to occur in the near future and why? So I think we're going to see an inflationary decade ahead. Uh, but as I've shared in some videos and, and uh, I think I've got another one that uh, I'll be sharing later this week that just shows that both uh, you go back to the 1940s or even the 1970s and you have these spikes in CPI. Okay. And then they, they come down, uh, but they never go necessarily negative. Um, so they come down but then they spike back up. And so you get the deflationists that go, oh, look here, we, we got deflation or, or disinflation. Um, but when you actually calculate it over the decade, you've actually got significant um, CPI there. So inflation is really just the expansion of the currency supply. Uh, prices are then determined by the amount of dollars chasing the amount of production of goods and services. So, um, so you, 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 to work out where prices are going, you need to look at where the demand of those new dollars are going uh, versus the amount of supply of goods and services. So if production increases significantly versus you know the uh, increase in currency supply, you don't necessarily get uh, increased in, in prices. Uh, we have conflated in modern times modern economics, modern dictionaries, universities, the education system has um, been able to change people's understanding of inflation from uh, you know, the expansion of the currency supply. You go back to the 1950s and 70s, look at uh, any dictionary, um, you know, um, an Oxford dictionary or, or, or whatever, and, um, and you'll see that it says in there, that inflation is the expansion of the currency supply. It's got nothing to do with prices. But now we think of inflation as prices going up and deflation prices going down. Um, so I just want to make that point. Now, I think with all the shut shutdowns, lockdowns, we've seen all the supply chain issues. Yep, some of those might be transitory in, in terms of, you know, as supply chains uh, improve that, uh, production in certain sectors or certain materials will improve significantly. However, we have permanently scarred the economy. We've permanently damaged uh, business. And it's business that uh, you know, produces uh, the goods and services that we, that, we, that we acquire. And so we've permanently scarred and permanently damaged uh, businesses. And, uh, you know, so... Uh, from that point of view, I I think there's an issue there. Um, we are seeing uh, governments and central banks around the world saying, no, 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 no time to slow down with the um, you know with the government purchases and the and the large deficits, government bond purchases and the large deficits. Even though there's been some talk of talking about talking about tapering. Uh, the the Fed just continued to increase their bond purchases last week. So uh, as I say, watch what they do, not what they say. Now, I do admit that there could be, um, well, there's some interesting things happening with uh, the repo market, with um, uh, Goldman Sachs just sold 25% uh, of their equity holdings. Uh, you've got Wells Fargo that have uh, shut down personal line of lines of credit uh, over the weekend. I just got told here in Australia by a large 
uh, supply firm that supplies uh, building materials to, to some of Australia's largest builders. And they work with a lot of publicly listed companies as well. Uh, they were expanding their business. And so they had their bank come in, which is one of Australia's major, uh, major banks. And um, the bank said to them, be careful who you supply building materials to, uh, because we're expecting um, a wave of defaults and bankruptcies in the construction sector. Um, so there, there are some issues there and, and, and you know, we, we could see a, a market downturn. So what I'm saying is we could see deflation in asset prices but not necessarily CPI. And remember back in 1973, 74, we saw a 50% fall in nominal terms in the stock market while CPI rose 12.5%. So people say that this can't happen. Well, it can, and it has happened. Um, so we can have high CPI while asset prices are falling. And I actually think that's a probable case. So on the inflation side, uh, and, and by the way, I... And, and sm people smarter than me say that if that happens and we do get a market crash uh, of any sort, that will give governments and central banks the excuse to put the uh, pedal to the metal in terms of deficit spin spending, creating new programs, uh, creating new currency units and just throwing it into the economy. And at that point, that's where some people smarter than me say we get the really high inflation, maybe even hyperinflation. Uh, so I don't think uh, consumer prices um, and commodity prices are gonna be cheaper uh, than what they are now in three years time or, or something like that. Uh, but I definitely see asset prices um, being overvalued on just about every metric, um, possibly uh, being in, in a bit of strife. Yeah, so you're talking about the market crash there and um, and a lot of economists are talking about how that's likely to occur very, very soon, even like in, in a few months time. Um, do you think that is likely to occur? And if you do, how do you see that playing out? Yeah, I, I think it's probable. Um, as I said, you know, I think, uh, you know, money managers are seeing risks in the system. Um, as I said, Wells Fargo have shut down, you know, all personal lines of credit. Um, you know, Goldman Sachs has sold 25% of their equity uh, holdings. Um, you know, we're seeing what's happening in the repo market where fund, uh, money managers are happy to park uh, their cash with the Fed rather than with the commercial banks in the repo market. So this is the reverse repo market uh, for five basis points. So um, to me, you know, some people say that's a collateral issue or a savings glut. Uh, what's not being spoke, spoken about is um, counterparty risk. Perhaps these mm. uh, money managers don't want to have, you know, the commercial banks and other institutions uh, as their counterparty in these trades and maybe they're more comfortable having the Fed as their counterparty. Um, you know, we've got record amounts of margin debt in the system. So we've had so much liquidity pumped in, so much margin debt and the mm -hmm. retail traders. So brand new investors into the market. It does remind me a lot of the dot-com bubble. So yeah, and then on every value metric you look at, yeah, you know, it's severely overvalued. And, uh, you know, the problem, the other thing Mike Green talks about a lot is with index uh, investing, ETF investing, passive investing. And even Jack Bogle, the founder of Vanguard said that, you know, once passive investing becomes, you know, 50% or more of the market, it no longer serves its purpose. In fact, it, it can be dangerous. And why is that? Because in with passive investing, uh, those managers that run those ETFs they can only buy or sell. Um, when you put your currency into uh, you know, uh, an ETF, they can only buy the index, okay? And then when you sell, uh, when you want you know, to turn that back into currency, they can only sell. 
uh, the index. You know, they can't decide, well, look, I'm going to buy this individual stock or this individual stock or this is undervalued or this is a dividend paying stock or, uh, you know, we might um, buy some gold or some silver or we'll sit in some uh, T-bills, short-term T-bills or something. They can't make those decisions. They can only buy and they can only sell. So when there's massive amounts of liquidity and people are buying into these um, uh, passive funds, uh, then that's great. That pushes the market up. The problem is, and this is what Jack Bogle was getting at and Mike Green talks about a lot, is when you've got such a huge, uh, you know, when, when the majority of the market is made up of passive investors, uh, what happens when everyone wants to sell? Okay, because yeah, that, that's all they can do. When, when you want your funds back, uh, you know, the fund manager can only sell. Who are they going to sell it to? So there's this big, big, I guess, hole in the market that the market could fall substantially because there's no floor, because there's no one buying when you've got so many sellers and no buyers. And this is where some people say that, uh, you know, in particular with the Fed, that the Federal Reserve Act will get changed. I think I've heard Danielle DiMartino Booth speak about this, that the uh, Federal Reserve Act will get changed at that point so that the Fed can come in and buy those ETFs. That's, um, you know, we don't have free market capitalism anymore. Um, that will be the final nail in the coffin for free market capitalism. If, mm. you know, we, we've, the Bank of Japan, they buy ETFs for, for their stock market. But if the US Federal Reserve is able to buy the stock market, then that's it. We, we no longer have uh, free market capitalism is dead and over with. Mm. So I hope they don't. I hope we have true price discovery. I hope they allow creative destruction to happen and, and free markets. Um, yeah, a lot of pain, but we need to wash out a lot of the debt in the system if we're going to have a uh, sustainable economy moving forward. I just don't, mm. I don't trust them to do the right thing. Uh, so yeah, I do, I do see a market crash. It could be very significant because also the amount of margin debt in the system. So when people start, uh, to sell and the market starts to fall and people start getting margin calls, well, I've experienced margin calls. I know what they're like. Um, and you know, you've got to either put in more capital or you've got to sell your positions and, and get it, get it down be below the, uh, LVR, the, um, loan to valuation ratio that, that they have. So, and then that just perpetuates things. So you just got selling on selling on selling on selling. Um, and to be honest, um, having experienced that, uh, as soon as you get a margin call, it's best just to sell, sell a whole position, move out. Uh, you, you think you, you know, you, you'll go get some, some of your capital and put in to keep, keep that position going. Uh, all you do is you just throw uh, bad money after another. So it's definitely not worth it. So uh, yeah, that's how I see it playing out. And then there will be pressure on Congress to, I believe, to change the Federal Reserve Act so that the Fed can kept, you know, come in and, and, and save the stock market, which will be a sad day. Yeah, I mean, we saw last year in March a bit of um, margin calls happening. Um, yeah, and, and the, the, yeah, that's very, very interesting yeah, how that's going to play out in the next next market crash. Um, if we um, just go a bit on gold now, um, and this is from someone that's actually a subscriber to, you, to your channel. Um, his, his question is, what do you think the probability of gold surpassing the $2,000 level this year will be? Well, it makes sense to me and it's not that big of a, a target. Um, I've said in a recent uh, video and I'll reinforce it in another video this week that, um, you know, 70, I think it's 72% of fund managers uh, believe, or I think it's 72% of fund managers believe that, uh, that the Fed are correct in their transitory language that, uh, inflation is just transitory. However, uh, CFOs and CEOs of 
companies say that, no, 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 uh, the Fed have lost control of inflation because the real, you know, what they're seeing, you know, they're, they're the ones that, you know, running these companies, they're seeing what their input costs are and, you know, what their labor costs are, all that sort of stuff. So they're seeing what real inflation is. Um, I believe that the fund managers have got a vested interest in saying that they believe that the Fed is right, that it's just transitory. Because if they don't go along with that, if they say, yeah, no, no, actually, you know, we're going to have a very bad inflationary decade ahead or years ahead or whatever, um, then we will, there'll be pressure on the Fed to taper and then to start, um, unwinding their balance sheet and lifting interest rates, which will one, take liquidity out of the market and two, uh, it will drive asset prices down. Uh, as interest rate rises, those asset prices will go down. That's not good news for these fund managers on Wall Street. Okay, they want, they want more liquidity. They want cheap, they want to borrow cheap. They want to get almost free cash so that they can invest also take other people's cash so that they can invest because people are like, well, hey, I can't sit in savings. You know, I'm not getting any interest. So I need to take risk. I need to go further out of the uh, risk curve. And well, these fund managers are like, well, hand it over. We'll, we'll, we'll get you a better return for it. So I believe it's in their interest to go along with the transitory uh, talk because that then gives the Fed the excuse and the government the excuse uh, to continue deficit spending, continue to uh, you know buy bonds and, and keep interest rates low and keep putting more liquidity into the system. Um, so it's in their interest. Uh, the thing is though, um, when people wake up and people realize that actually the Fed has lost control of inflation, um, when I say inflation, I'm talking CPI now, um, so when people realize that it's no longer transitory, even though everything is transitory, it, it's, yeah, and I've shared that in other videos. Transitory simply means um, not permanent, okay? Everything's not permanent. But this inflation, they're creating the inflation. And with the supply issues, I mean, that's it's a no-brainer that, that prices are going to rise, in my opinion. And, you know, there's no signs that they're going to um, stop that. And so when people finally wake up to go, you know what, I, my savings, my income, uh, the dollars that I'm getting paid are BND based and I'm losing purchasing power and people finally go, you know what, I want to get a little bit of gold or I want to get a little bit of silver. Um, that's when we're going to see, I think, a very rapid rise in, in the price of gold and silver. And you know, that could definitely well happen by the end of the year. So 2000, I, you know, I think 2000 is, well, that's my target, um, two, 2000 to $2,100 by the end of the year for gold. That's my target. So, yeah. Yeah, well, I hope so. <laughs> um, what is, uh, if you could briefly answer this, um, what is your outlook on the 10-year treasury or US treasury bonds in the medium term? medium term i will say the yields will go up in the medium term in the short term we've seen that the yields have gone from what 1.7 down to under 1.3 uh, on the 10 year and that just seems to coincide with the large spikes uh in the reverse repo market uh so back in what i think it was about april uh, this year uh that that, that started um uh, you know, I, I haven't seen anything or heard anyone really explain if there is some correlation there, but it's just interesting. Um, and, and look, if we're, certainly if we get that market crash, then, you know, and this is where Jim Rogers and, and Brent Johnson and others say that, well, you know, there will be a, you know, increased demand on the US dollar. Um you know, and, and there'll be a run on the dollar. So the the Dixie, the DXY could probably go back up. I think, what did it hit March last year? 102, I think, from memory, something around there. Uh, the Aussie dollar actually, what we hit about 56 against the US. 
Um, we're sitting at, uh, what are we sitting at right now? Uh, just under 74. Uh, we hit a high of about 78, 79 recently. So that's, that's come down. So I, I actually could see that the US Treasury could continue to fall if we get this market crash and everyone thinks that we're going to have this huge deflation. But then, as I said, uh, that would just give central banks and governments to literally put their uh, foot to the floor and just print, 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 and, and do all sorts of uh, new programs, probably permanent UBI, I don't know, you name it. And so then we will see significant um, CPI. But you know, in, in that, a lot of companies will probably go broke. That's less businesses. Yeah, in the short term, that's deflationary. But uh, in the medium term, that means less businesses producing less goods and services. At the same time, governments and central banks are going to be creating new currency units. So it's kind of economics 101, really, or maybe it's not because we're taught this Keynesian rubbish in universities, but Austrian economics 101. So, yeah, but then, you know, with that inflation, uh, you know, rates will rise uh, eventually. And so the 10 year will rise in the medium term. In the short term, I'm not a trader of, of bonds. Uh, I don't like bonds. I don't own them, don't buy them. Um, not right now anyway. But um, yeah, so yes, they could go down the yield that is. Um, so the bond price could go up in the short term. But then, as I said, I think bonds are in the biggest bubble out there. Um, I think the stock market is cheap compared to <laughs> the bond market. And so I don't want to be nowhere near bonds, um, even government bonds, um, so-called safe bonds. Anyway. Yeah. Um, this is actually from another uh, subscriber. Um, his name is Ibis Man. And three days ago, he commented in one of your videos. And this is his question. What do you think the fund managers are agreeing with the Fed in that this higher inflation is transitory? Um, yeah, as I said before, I think they've got a vested interest in going along with the transitory um, narrative because if it's transitory, that means we're about to go into disinflation or deflation. So that means, well, hey, governments keep keep deficit spending, increase those deficits. Central banks, you know, come on, keep keep buying those government bonds. Um, you know, George Gemmon talks, you know, about the dealer banks just being a shell game and they kind of really are. Um, where they're the middleman, uh, they're the ones buying uh, at uh, the treasury auctions, but then they're just selling them uh, straight to the Fed. Um, uh, so yeah, and that obviously creates liquidity, keeps interest rates low. So people need to go further and further out the risk curve, you know, retirees. I mean, who was it? Um, was it Summers? I saw an article just late last week. Um, I haven't read it. I've saved it. Um, no, it wasn't Summers. Was it one of the big investment banks? Anyway, someone can um, probably write in the comments below who this was, but they said that, uh, you know, for retirees, you're just going to have to take more risk. You know, you, the headline was something along the lines of, you know, you, you, you're going to have to work longer. You're going to have to take more risk. Uh, with investing, um, you know, so, you know, these investment banks, fund managers, they've got a vested interest, I believe, to promote and push the narrative that it's transitory. Um, but as I said, who would you rather believe, uh, Wall Street or the CEOs and CFOs who are actually running the companies and seeing, you know, what their input costs are and, and all that sort of stuff. So that that's, that's what I'd say. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to wrap up, but just last thing that I wanted to, to share, um, and this is a question, but also it's an answer from another subscriber. Um, it's from James Rickman. Um, five days ago, he posted this. What's the difference between a bank robber and a bank manager? And his answer is a suit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good sam <laughs> i like that one um yeah. who who wrote that 
Um, his name is James Rickman. James Rickman, uh, mate, you're yeah, too yeah. smart. Uh, <laughs> Got to stop telling the truth, mate. You might get uh, you might get cancelled. Uh, anyway, no, that's true. That's great. I love it. Thanks, James. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot for this, Steve. Um, well, I think it's time that we should end this one. But um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to the, the next time we meet and talk more about the, the economy and whatnot. Yeah. Cool, Sam. Enjoyed it. Love it. See you next time. Awesome. Yeah. See you later. All right. See ya.